everybody, my teachers. My teachers, my colleagues, and uh, my juniors. So a very warm uh, welcome to all of you. Today we are going to discuss about upper gastrointestinal bleeding in infants and children. What should be our ideal approach? And what we can do and what we can find. So, well, let's uh, start with the types and anatomical classification. Upper gastrointestinal bleeding, we call about uh, when the bleeding originates proximal to the ligament of trades, that is the junction of duodenum and jejunum. It includes bleeding from sources in the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. But also keep in mind that upper gastrointestinal bleeding can also be due to um, bleeding uh, from above the esophagus also. Sometimes posterior wall of the throat, posterior nasal can cause upper gastrointestinal bleeding and it can manifest like that. A lower gastrointestinal bleeding, bleeding distal to the ligament of traits and thus include bleeding sources in the small bowel and the colon. And some people actually uh, really like to divide it in mid-GI bleeding and a colonic bleeding or the lower GI bleeding. So lower GI bleeding might be mid-GI bleeding as well as true lower GI bleeding. Mid-GI bleeding is the bleeding arising from the small bowel. And bleeding from the colon is the true lower gastrointestinal bleeding. There is another name, what we can also find in the uh, text that is called obscure GI bleeding. What is obscure GI bleeding? Obscure GI bleeding is a bleeding where um, upper GI endoscopy and colonoscopy fails to find the bleeding source. So it, that's why we can we sometimes call that as obscure GI bleeding. And many times obscure GI, what is happening with this, all these lines are coming here. Many times um, the bleeding, uh, obscure GI bleeding arises from the mid gastrointestinal tract. And that's why upper and lower GI endoscopy, that is seeing up to the terminal part of ileum, often don't find any particular source of bleeding. An enteroscopy or capsule endoscopy or radiological study or radionuclide scan sometimes can give glimpse about the source of bleeding in those cases. So what is happening with this? Why this has happened? This uh, red spots in the slides. The spots has come, you go ahead, don't worry. I don't know. Um, anyway. Hematochesia is a term that is passage of bright red blood per rectum. It usually suggests lower GI bleeding and typically from colon and anus. But hematochesia can also be due to upper gastrointestinal bleeding. Mind that in an infant, if it is short intestinal transit time and a massive bleeding from the upper gastrointestinal tract, then it can cause also hematochesia even for the upper gastrointestinal bleeding. So possibility of upper GI bleeding should be considered in an individual with hematochesia and hemodynamic compromise. Melina is a black study stool, usually suggests Usually, it needs about 5 ml per kg blood in the intestine to be present uh, to have a melina. And consider swallowed blood from nose and mouth also as a cause of melina. All slides have got like this. Uh, uh, so, what are the causes of upper gastrointestinal bleeding in infants? If we just consider a infants, we can. Um, Divide the causes in a well baby and unwell baby. In well baby, we can uh, usually we can, the causes are swallowed maternal blood, vitamin K deficient bleeding. So always ask about the vitamin K whether the child has got it during birth or not, especially in urine. Or if it is in leg, uh, and also can be due to deficiency of vitamin K. So you have to give vitamin K. Trauma, food protein intolerance, and hyperplastic polyp. Uh, in the upper um, gastrointestinal tract, that is in the stomach, can cause uh, GI bleed in a well baby. In an unwell baby, stress gastritis or ulcer, vascular malformation, sometimes vascular malformation, they bleed massively and they can be very unwell. Coagulopathy associated with sepsis or liver failure, Con uh, congenital coagulation factor deficiency, sometimes they can be very unwell because of the uh, severe bleeding and gastroesophageal varices and drug induced causes. They, there can be due to um, the baby can be very unwell when they present with the bleeding. And in cases of children, and older children, old, and um, even in adolescents, 
What are the causes? In a well child, suddenly if there is bleeding, peptic esophagitis, gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer might be the cause. But in these three cases, usually we get lots of, uh, actually, if we take a very good history, we can find that they have uh, a prolonged um, abdominal pain, sometimes prolonged dyspepsia uh, before the onset of the bleeding. And other causes like vascular causes, a well child suddenly has massive blood. So it can be angiotasia, it can be AB malformation, it can be vasculitis. Sometimes HSP present with pain and hematemesis at the same time, and they don't have even the rashes. If you don't have a suspicion or in high index of suspicion, then you can actually, uh, may not diagnose at that point of time, you may diagnose later on. And drug-induced causes, foreign body ingestion and coagulopathy also can cause sudden bleeding in a very well child. In an unwell baby, malaria based tear, when they have repeated retching with the vomiting, esophageal varices, obviously a chronic liver disease patients, gastric varices, chronic liver disease patients, or bleeding from the portal hepatitis and gastropathy, they are all chronic liver disease patients. So they are relatively unwell. And coagulopathy due to septicemia or dengue and other hemorrhagic fever, they can cause uh, bleeding due to any causes and they can have massive gastropathy or hemorrhagic gastropathy and causing severe hematemesis that also we have seen. So these patients are usually unwell. So what are the normal pathophysiological consequences of the blood loss? So there is usually loss of fluid, then uh, the decrease in the extracellular fluid, dehydration, shock, then a decrease in the, uh, the glomerular filtration rate and there can be anemia. That it is usually a prenatal ARF and a small volume concentrated urine with high specific gravity. That is the usual pathology for any kind of loss, be it in diarrhea, be it in blood loss. So high risk of hemorrhagic shock in children, especially infants, because age-dependent vital signs are inaccurate in interpretation of early signs, because sometimes people may not recognize their play and well and playful, and suddenly they go into drowsiness. So high ratio of surface area to body mass, limited thermal regulation, hypothermia, pulmonary hypertension, hypoxemia, acidosis, similar total blood, uh, very smaller total blood volume, and lower hematocrit levels. So all this predispose them to develop more hemorrhagic shock than older children or in adolescents. Sequence of compensatory mechanisms, loss of less than 15% of blood volume in compensated by concentration of the venous system, fluid shift from the extracellular fluid space to the intravascular fluid space, and then preferential direction of blood to the brain and the uh, heart. So there is usually no hemodynamic changes, but if it is more blood loss, 15 to 30 percent of blood volume loss, then there is sympathetic stimulation and consequences of hemodynamic instability, loss of tachycardia, there may be decrease in oxygen saturation, there may be tissue hypoxia, and then uh, we have to, the, the system has to regulate quite a lot to maintain the blood volume. So we have to actually intervene from. So how do we manage these patients? They can present with small amount of hematemesis, there can be massive hematemesis, there can be large amount of malaria, and they can also kind of dizziness, and they might be unconscious suddenly. So usually the initial evaluation of the patient with upper GI or be it in lower GI is an assessment of the ABC. But always we have to do for any other patient. Hemodynamic stability should be actively assessed. Resuscitation should be carried out if necessary. And diagnostic studies, usually endoscopy and other studies follow with the goal of diagnosing the cause of the bleed. So in history, we have to take a good history. After we have uh, secured the ABC, we have uh, started the resuscitation process, then we have to take a good history. So distinction is tool color are not absolute because Melina can be seen with proximal low GI bleeding also. So we have to be very careful whether we are really dealing with upper GI bleeding if, it, if they present with only Melina. Hematoclasia can be seen with massive upper GI bleed as I have already said. So recent onset of jaundice, is it bruising, change in its tool color, so these are also uh, indicative of there might be some liver disease. So family history of liver, kidney, or heart disease, or population disorders. We have to take very carefully, and drug history should never be forgot, because we often forget to take the drug history, and they can have a massive, some unknown drug, or sometimes lots of NCID. So examination, first, we have to see that after we have resuscitated, how is the child now? Well or unwell? Very sick child with massive bleeding. So we have to think that we are dealing with something very serious cause or there might be associated infection. Examination, we should examine starting from the nasopharynx, oropharynx. 
and valor should be evaluated very carefully and jaundice charges hepatic failure and we should not if it is a bleeding test we should not forget about normal uh, vital signs and normal general examinations so we had a patient who had come with a very low hemoglobin and people were thinking there might be some blood loss but we forgot to see that whether there was any clubbing or not so we should not do that so we have to follow the usual general examinations as we see animal cirrhosis jaundice clubbing and anything is there so we should note that because jaundice will suggest that there might be hepatic failure and that the causes of the gi bleeding will be different and the abdominal examination should evaluate for hepatomegaly splenomegaly ascites or all those because if somebody presenting with um, hepatomegaly splenomegaly and hematemesis then obviously you will uh, first think about the uh, varicell bleeding as a cause of uh, the first and prime cause of the gi bleeding and there may be associated some other gastropathy but we should think about that and because our management line will be also it uh, directed according to that thinking non specific systemic signs such as apnea respiratory failure lethargy poor feeding in very um, uh, young infants or new nets there might be early features of any c and in any c with the gastropathy they can have like, some amount of hematemesis often we have seen somebody who was ng phase uh, in neonatal age and they suddenly start with um, uh, the red or coffee ground uh, aspirates from the ng or with the milk some coffee ground aspirates are coming so in those cases we have to think of whether the child is going for nec or a septicemic septicemic episode so examination of the skin for cutaneous signs of generalized vascular malformation we had a patient who have who came with um, massive hematemesis and when we started examining there are lots of uh, uh, like blue uh, nevus in the back as well as in the periphery so then we thought that it might be like ocular endo waver disease and the findings in the uh, endoscopy also was like that so bilious emesis in the neonatal period should be assumed uh, to represent a surgical emergency so due to obstruction until proven otherwise and they can also sometimes present with hematemesis we had a patient with intussusception due to severe obstruction they had severe bleeding severe um, retching and vomiting during the crying episode and with the retching they had a the um, uh, malary was tear and that person actually presented with hematemesis rather than um, screaming abdominal pain and um, blood in the stool so it was a different presentation but ultimate diagnosis was intussusception so we have to be very careful while we are uh, really examining the child so investigation we usually do the basic investigation complete blood count if we do only one investigation we should have one hemoglobin and a uh, pcp hematocrit because with hemoglobin if we don't do the hematocrit we won't know that how much concentrated is the hemo concentration was there due to the bleeding because the, our hemodynamic system was adjusting so often we have seen that hemoglobin was maintained at 11 but the hematocrit was 39 for where it was supposed to be 33 or 34 so in those cases we have to take this 11 and with a pinch of salt because the actual hemoglobin might be 10 so this is the thing we have to always do uh, look at the hemoglobin with the hematocrit and we should send for coagulation studies liver functions blood urine nitrogen because azotemia is seen uh, in massive hematemesis type and cross match step we always take the sample and keep it uh, for the transfusion requirement and up down it is only applicable for the neonatal bleeding and blood culture when we whenever we find that a very sick child stool inspection by the healthcare uh, personnel should be done because often mom, mom mother says that well it is uh, it is black stool but sometimes we find that it's a like little bit of brown stool and sometimes if you are in doubt you uh, flush the stool with uh, water and see whether red things are going, going out or it's becoming red so then that is um, suggestive of melina we can do an abdominal x ray to suggest to rule out any intestinal obstruction especially in the um young infants to rule out any c and c paralytic alias or surgical causes and ultrasound examination especially wherever we are suspecting liver disease so next investigation once the child is already resuscitated we know the basic investigation we are suspecting something then we go for endoscopy so when to do endoscopy this is one of the thing because everybody every pediatrician think well, endoscopy should be come last if we can't then endoscopy Uh, should be done it's not that ideally if it is a massive bleeding endoscopy should be done first thing and if you see there is hemoglobin drop endoscopy should be done and endoscopy whether to do or not it the gastroenterologist should be informed within first 24 hours 
because sometimes the decision might uh, it's a, sometimes decision to take the decision to do an endoscopy becomes a little bit difficult and sometimes gastroenterologists make it uh, easier to take the decision and when to do what to do whether or not to do at all if it is a small bleeding and it has stopped already you may not do but if it is a massive bleeding and there is significant hemoglobin drop significant hemoglobin drop we always say it's more than 2 gram percent hemoglobin uh, change that is reduction in the hemoglobin more than 2 gram uh, percent so endoscopy will help how find out the source well for the diagnosis particular diagnosis then endotherapy can be done this is very important if it is a massive bleeding and the bleeding is continuing then endotherapy is easily easy to do because the days are gone where for bleeding we are doing a surgery days are gone for peptic ulcer disease we are doing a surgery so just take the help of the endoscopy and then the problem will be solved reassess to see whether bleeding is has stopped or not so initially the bleeding might stop and sometimes it re bleeds lots of peptic ulcer disease even after doing endotherapy there is 6 to 10% chance of depending on the type of ulcer re bleeding without endotherapy there is always a massive chance of 30 to 60% re bleeding so we have to be very careful and if we do the endoscopy then all these problems will be easily solved and if it is issue with the growth bleeding from a growth then biopsy can be taken from the growth and ultimately definitive therapy can be proposed and can be we can take the decision that how and how we can proceed with this patient so when significant bleeding continues and does not respond to pharmacotherapy endoscopy is 100% necessary so hematemesis melina always we do upper gi endoscopy sigma endoscopy when there is it is associated with hematochezia so just to if upper endoscopy we do not do so we, we always plan that we will see look for a sigmoid whether there is lots of blood there and if and we will look for a upper gi endoscopy but sometimes if we can find a cause in the upper gi endoscopy we just uh, don't do that we just um, uh, abandon the sigmoidoscopy colonoscopy when there is hematochezia and we are really thinking that it might be from the mid gi or from the lower gi an endoscopy obviously for the obscure gi bleeding as i have told, told that upper gi endoscopy and colonoscopy and endoscopy failed to find out a source of bleeding so in endoscopy when we find ulcers we have a classification we call it porous classification we don't need it for the juniors but for our importance we always try to do it do this because this classification actually um, uh, give us the prognosis of the and how much endotherapy should be done and they give a prognosis for this um, rebleed so this is very important if we find a 1a this is in this porous classification there is a three major group that is 1 2 and 3 and 1 always indicates there is active hemorrhage and 1a is the bright red bleeding that is sprouting the bleeding just sprouts out and 1b is slow bleeding like oozing from a um as a base blood vessels or a uh, small blood vessel recent hemorrhage already had hemorrhage and we are seeing this hemorrhage now and there is little bit uh, not that much active bleeding like one these are two a two b two c non bleeding visible vessel adrenal clot plaque pigment spot but wow is the why this is so important clean breast ulcer we don't bother because there is no usually there is no um, blood or there is no hemorrhage from this Uh, bleeding uh, from the no bleeding from this ulcers but in active hemorrhage in if it is this 1a 1b then if we don't do an endotherapy it may stop for a moment but chance of re bleeding is nearly up to 60% so you have to keep that in mind and even in recent hemorrhage group if there is non bleeding visible vessel and adrenal clot and if we don't do endotherapy chance of re bleeding is around 25 to 30% but if we do some endotherapy then chance of re bleeding comes down to very less in this group it is like 50 to 20% and here it's like 6 to 10% only so this is the thing which this classification was very important at some point of time when people used to define that whether to do or not to do the endotherapy so what are the things what endoscopy can find when we enter So this was a small, uh, uh, one-month-old uh, little um, boy who came with massive hematemesis. Hemoglobin came down to previous hemoglobin. I think during neonatal age it was twelve, and he came at this time it was hemoglobin was eight. And when we entered, we found in the fundus there is a small source and trickle of blood coming down. It was an angiotensia. 
So we did an uh, endotherapy for this and the child did well. Or we can find a large ulcer or, or a large fundal erosion, I mean like erosive lesions we can say. And this often sometimes with the vomiting episode, with the retching, there is prolapse of the fundal mucosa through the esophagus and it starts bleeding from these points. So this we can find, but here is, if there is no active bleeding, here is active bleeding. So this needs endotherapy. We won't do endotherapy here. Or what, we, what else we can find? We can find a lesion like this. Look at this. This was a child who came with a dropping hemoglobin and history of melina. So we said, well, let's go in and see. The child was otherwise stable because hemoglobin was eight and, um, and there was no previous hemoglobin to compare. But when we entered, we saw at the contest, look at this point, the trickle of blood from a single point. He was an older child. Um, his age was eight years. And this, this type of lesion in the fundus actually is called a dulapha lesion. See how the blood comes down and it trickles and trickles until we do endotherapy and sometimes very rarely it stops um, of its own. So this trickles and trickles and hemoglobin gradually drops and sometimes it can have a massive bleeding. This is trickling. That's why the child was stable. But sometimes they have a massive bleeding child becomes very uh, dizzy and sometimes unconscious and they, their hemoglobin drops from about 11 to 4. So this is another kind of dolopala. This is the child who came with a hemoglobin of four and he needed two transfusions. And after that we entered and still we found that blood was trickling down. So this is another lesion, a five month old who came with a history of hematemesis, hemoglobin dropped to six gram and received a transfusion and then came to us. It was a poly and it was bleeding frequently because when we took the history, mother gave the history that child was actually having vomiting repeatedly and the child was um, and this time had a quite lot of hematemesis and then uh, the child, the hemoglobin dropped and child became pale. And this type of polyp is very rare actually. It's a antral hyperplastic polyp. We reported this case and, um, and this is one of the rare finding, but still we can find it because if we don't do endoscopy, uh, this was our first case of antral hyperplastic polyp, but after that we have got two more cases actually antral hyperplastic polyp. These polyps are sometimes very difficult and these are very mobile polyps, but they go through the antrum to the first part of duodenum and then again come back here. And often they cause um, due to, uh, obstruction from the gastric antrum. So when they cause obstruction, they often they can present like um, uh, severe vomiting, like uh, gastric outlet obstruction. So what endoscopy can, uh, other things that we can find, we can sometimes we see gastric vascular ectasia. When there is lots of collateral due to portal hypertension, we can have lots of vascular ectasia in the stomach or in the duodenum, And this can cause suddenly, uh, one spot can cause sudden bleeding. Um, or it can have a mallory waste tear. Sometimes mallory waste tears are very prominent. We can see from the, uh, when we enter through the esophagus, but sometimes we may not see and in the uh, G junction, when we retrovert in the fundus, we can see it here. It was a tiny tear, but it was bleeding. So that's why we needed an uh, endoscopy. Look at this. This is a very deep ulcer in the stomach. And sometimes these deep ulcers have a massive bleeding like sprouting blood. And this is one of the stomach ulcer. And this is one of the duodenal ulcer. This is an ulcer for where we can say this is the forest get grade two uh, C. But it had actually already bled. So, or if somebody has a chronic liver disease, what we can find things like this. So we, we often expect that things will be like this. Um, just wait because we are doing the endoscopy and I think it was not entering uh, from the, that was not uh, fully sedated. So now it is entering and look at this, the lower end of the esophagus. The massive varices with red color sign. These red signs are we say are CS or red color signs. So massive varices, lots of columns, and they bleed massively. And hemoglobin drops like anything. Or we can find varices in the stomach. These are the gastric varices. And when gastric varices bleed, they bleed like sprout. Even the ulcer, what I was saying in the forest classification 1A, it bleeds like this, sprouting blood. Massive blood, blood is accumulating here. See, this is sprouting of blood. This is from the gastric varices. And when this bleed, the patient may die suddenly if we cannot detect it. And this is the portal hepatitis gastropathy. 
and they have this red, red lesions and often sometimes these red lesions, one or two red lesions bleed massively and sometimes it becomes very difficult to even stop the bleeding. And this is one of the portal appurtenances lesion. This is called GAV or gastric anterior vascular ectasia. Lots of red lesion and, uh, that moves like spoke of wheel in the antrum, in the pylorus. And this is one of the treated gastric varices. It has become hard and it's not bleeding. So it is a treated gastric varice. So all these things we can find in endoscopy. And if you don't find in the endoscopy and sometimes taking in the uh, look in the lower down also, we may have to take help of the uh, contrast study. We, but we don't do contrast study nowadays at all because uh, it has a very, very minimal load. We go for CT abdomen, usually CT angio, followed by oral contrast CT or oral contrast MR, just to exclude any duplication cyst. Look at this, this is a gastric duplication cyst. Sometimes when they, they have abnormal blood vessels and when they have a, a kind of rotation and then these abnormal blood vessels usually massively bleed into the stomach lumen and then they can present as hematemesis or usually they can present in the intestinal hemorrhage like they often have a, a melina or hematochesia uh, when they have massive bleed, especially in the intestinal duplication cyst. And this is one of the CT angio where you usually look at the angiogram first and then we go for the oral contrast. So this is one of the 3D reconstructed CT angiography where we can see there is a vascular malformation. You can see this here, this vascular malformation. So sometimes endoscopy, endoscopy fail and then we have an answer from the uh, CT angiography. This is a reconstructed image and those who are very expert in uh, uh, interpreting the, look at this, this is a the bunch of, uh, like bunch of grapes this kind of malformation, this is the AV malformation, and that, that was causing repeated massive bleeding for this patient. So what we do, nasogastric tube, often people say, well, patient came with massive hematitis, put a nasogastric tube and see what is coming from there. Usually we are not following this, but if you're like severe bleeding, you can do that, but never do a lavage or aspiration. You can just keep the tube in free drainage and just to see what is coming. Clear drainage often makes that bleeding was uh, not really from the upper GI or sometimes coffee grounds that is clearing so suggests that bleeding might have stopped and coffee grounds with fresh blood that bleeding is continuing. And often sometimes if you're in the peripheral region uh, and peripheral zone and then whether if it is bleeding continuing like fresh blood is coming on, you have to really resuscitate the patient and transfer where there is endoscopic facility or gastroenterologists are available. So these are the things where we can uh, determine that well um, we don't have the facility here and then we can determine that how much bleeding is occurring and uh, whether only therapy will, uh, pharmacotherapy or the resuscitative therapy or the supportive therapy will do or whether we have to take the help of gastroenterologists. These are the things previously people used to take decision. But nowadays you have availability of gastroenterologists uh, in many places. So you can give a call to the gastroenterologist and if you have a free drainage, you can have, have some interpretation. But ultimate interpretation should be from the um, uh, camera. So supportive treatment, obviously, factor BC transfusion. If the target hemoglobin is uh, hemoglobin is very low, and our target hemoglobin should be nine gram, we don't want to over transfuse to twelve because more you transfuse, there are two studies which have proved that more you transfuse, more will be the blood loss again because if we haven't done an endotherapy. So that's why we target should be nine gram, but we should transfuse. And for a seven gram, we are happy to do an endoscopy usually. FFP and platelet if needed. Uh, if massive transmission is needed because we, uh, as an intensive care protocol, we often want to give one is to one is to one because to avoid complications. Albumin, if it is uh, already had liver disease and massive hypoglycemia also, and antibiotics when baricell bleeding in CLD or prevent septic shock or in papillopathy. This is these are must. And other cases, if you are suspecting um, septicemia or infection, then of course you should give antibiotics. What are the pharmacotherapies usually? Whenever you are suspecting there will be bleeding from the uh, stomach uh, or from the ulcer kind of bleeding, then it will be uh, usually PPI. Uh, this is the most essential and PPI has actually um, changed the management of uh, the ulcer bleeding and uh, changed the surgical protocol in the um, GI bleeding in, the, in cases of peptic ulcer. And PPI has uh, done really, very well. So after PPI, the mortality and morbidity has decreased in the um, peptic ulcer bleeding. 
So we have to start. Usually we give IV infusion. We give a bolus and followed by uh, infusion of this red 0.2 milligram per kg per hour. But we have a crude level like we give four milligram. Um, we give 40 milligram bolus, then we maintain it with four milligram. We give uh, 20 milligram bolus, and then we maintain it with two milligram per kg, uh, two milligram per hour. So have obviously ranitidine kind of H2 blockers you can give, but these are not that much um, helpful or that much effective as PPI. So PPI is the uh, best and the first and foremost. Vitamin K, obviously, if there is hemolytic disease of the newborn or late hemolytic disease or liver disease, you have to give vitamin K. But if you, even if you, if you are not dealing with this disease, if you give one dose of vitamin K, it will never harm. And pharmacotherapy, when you are suspecting uh, very severe bleeding and a chronic liver disease, obviously the drug of choice is nowadays octreotide. We used to give vasopressin, but now it is octreotide. We usually give two microgram per kg body weight uh, bolus, followed by uh, one to three microgram per kg per hour infusion. And octreotide actually has also done very well uh, managing the very cell bleeding until we do an endoscopy. So before doing endoscopy, octreotide can take care of the uh, bleeding and it can actually reduce the uh, blood flow into the varices, into the uh, splanchnic circulation, and thereby reducing the splanchnic pressure and thereby um, uh, reducing the amount of blood, amount of bleeding. So then we come to the, once we have given the supportive therapy, we are coming to the endotherapy. So usually we train, in any case of JIB bleeding, we want to do the end, uh, endoscopy and endotherapy within the first 24 hours because if it is not very cell bleeding or kind of lesions which are causing uh, common uh, bleeding repeatedly, it, if it is a transient bleed, especially vascular bleed, if it is a bleeding vessel from an ulcer base, all these things, if we, if we see it from within 24 hours, it's best, so it's the possibility of um, identifying those are the very best within the first 24 hours. If it is not within 24 hours, it should be within 48 hours. So, so if you want to refer to a gastroenterologist, it should be within the first 24 hours so that we can also plan and do it within the first 48 hours. Because otherwise, sometimes we don't find it and patients give, uh, become very disheartened. Well, the vascular bleeding was not identified. So might bleeding we might continue. We might have same episode again. How can you guarantee that there won't be any episode? So that's why all these questions can be uh, we can answer very well if we can do it within uh, 24 to 48 hours. Vascular bleeding, even if it is sometimes seen within 24 hours, sometimes it stops within an hour. Bleeding has massive bleeding has occurred and suddenly it stops. This uh, are more common in cases of when it happens from the mid GI or the small bowel, but uh, usually from the stomach and duodenum, usually we can identify these causes. So in endotherapy, what what are the things which can we can do? We can inject adrenaline if we don't have any other thing. We can use the heater probe. We have unipolar, bipolar probe. Bipolar probe is a gold or silver probe. And unipolar probe, we have a normal thermocautery. Hemoclips, we can apply. We have hemoclips and there we can uh, bind the vessels with the clip. We can actually grab the vessels with the clip and then uh, the vessel constricts and it um, ultimately the bleeding stops. And we can do for argon plasma coagulation, which is a very revolutionary and very good and very effective, especially for NGFTCS, for particular kind of lesion that I have already shown. And EVA, endoscopic variceal band ligation, for ligation for all the esophageal varices and glue injection for gastric varices. So all these things uh, we usually do. There are many other things also we can do uh, or improvise according to the patient's uh, need. But these are the usual endoscopic therapies, what I have mentioned. So this is the principle of the endoscopic therapy of the thermocotteries. We apply the cautery, the vessel gets coagulated, and ultimately it um, gets disconnected, the flow drops get disconnected, and then we, we don't have any further bleeding. So this is one of the um, uh, video what I am showing is um, this is the applying injection adrenaline. This is an ulcer, you can see, this is situated in the D1, D2 junction. This, this junction, we often get an ulcer and it becomes very difficult to see and to apply things. We are injecting adrenaline here. So we inject adrenaline actually around the ulcer. This was the ulcer and we are injecting adrenaline in the four quadrants of the ulcer. So we inject in all the quadrants, all four quadrants. And after that, what happens? It becomes like a solen thing and with adrenaline, the vasoconstriction occurs and then the bleeding stops. Look at this after injecting, this is the appearance. There was no active bleeding. And after that, we at the 
after uh, in the adrenaline injection, we often apply the gold probe. But there is a theory that we apply the cream or gold probe first, and then you can inject adrenaline. And or just sometimes you can just do the uh, probe only. This is the application of the gold probe. This is one of the very effective uh, bipolar thermopotary. Uh, you can see this is the same ulcer. This is a probe which has a gold. You can see gold color at the end. So this we are applying, giving the thermocotry, you see. We have seen the thermocotry and then the vessel coagulates here. With the same theory, see, it becomes black. You have to press it for 10 seconds and it becomes black and the, there is the vessel gets coagulated and it's uh, the bleeding stops. So we are again applying for another 10 seconds. If you count, it will, you will see that it will be, it is applied for 10 seconds. Otherwise it does not sometimes be incomplete. So this is the urban plasma coagulation. This is the method I have shown one little child of uh, angioectasia. We have done the urban plasma coagulation for this. And this was the spot. Actually surrounding there were a little bit small oozing. So we, were, we have done uh, coagulation from the surrounding place also. So this was the urban plasma coagulation for the angioectasia. And uh, with that, I'm uh, giving, this is the, this is the child, uh, three days ago I have done it. This is a child who, who, who was admitted with a hemoglobin of 3.5 gram with massive hepatosplenic megaly and ascites we and clubbing. We were suspecting about uh, a liver disease, but uh, I was thinking that I might be getting a varix, but uh, I didn't get any varix and it was a bleeding from the duodenum, first part of duodenum. And there were lots of lymphonodular hyperplasia. From one of the lymphonodular hyperplasia, it was bleeding. So what I did, I did an argon, argon plasma coagulation. Again in that, and uh, the bleeding uh, stops. See, this is the ultimate appearance and the bleeding stopped after this. There's no further bleeding, it was bleeding so massively. And 3.5 hemoglobin with the transfusion during the process, uh, the hemoglobin rose to 6.5 gram and then after that it rose to uh, 9.5 gram. So once we have stopped the bleeding, many times the problem is solved, but that this child was getting blood transfusion every day and hemoglobin didn't improve for seven days, it stayed around 3.5. 3.5 to 4. This is the hemoclip. We apply hemoclip on the base of the ulcer when we, we can see the vessel. So uh, I don't have a good video to uh, see the application, but this is kind of hemoclip. We can show you this is kind of thing. And these are the clips. We actually eject, eject the clip from the uh, our endoscopes. And for the uh, varicell bleeding. We previously, we used to have the sensitive blank motif when we don't have endoscopy available overnight or available in, within 24 hours. We used to put the sensitive blank motif, which has a balloon and used to inflate it here. And with the pressure, the varices used to be uh, get collapsed. And uh, then uh, ultimately, when we take out their use, the mite, there is a chance of massive bleeding. But it's actually, I have never used endoscopic tube because we have always done endoscopies for the uh, massive bleeding. Uh, so, but for emergency, it can be helpful, especially in the peripheral places where we don't have a facility for endoscopies. So band ligation is the revolutionary technique. What do we do? These are the bands. When we put the varix, we suck the varix inside and then we uh, eject the band and the after application, it looks like this. So this is one of our patient who had uh, massive varixes and this is banding of one of the varix. So look at this, we have sucked it out in the band when we suck it the whole screen becomes red and then we eject it so after ejection it becomes like this so it's a band already applied you can see this here so this is one of the gastric varicell bleeding as i have shown the video so as this is gastric varicell bleeding gastric bleeding and now it is so we have applied a glue we apply a glue usually some apply a glue and we put the glue inside and it becomes thick and very stiff and it does not bleed the whole blood and thing coagulates and it becomes stiff. Cyanoacrylate makes it. And after that, we also have for uh, severe uh, uh, bleeding when we, we cannot control the variceal bleeding, esophageal variceal bleeding with, um, even for EVL, then we have a specific stent available that is called Danish stent. It's a little bit costlier, but we put the stent in the, I don't have a good video. My video was actually corrupt. Uh, we can corrupt it somehow. So I couldn't show you. It's um, a Danish stent, which is get, uh, we apply it in the lower part of lower one third of esophagus. And with the stent, with the pressure of the stent, the barracks gets um, collapsed 
and after 24 hours we remove the stent and then ultimately uh, the bleeding uh, control can be achieved. So sometimes we may have to do surgery. Surgery is sometimes very much with the mid-gut bleeding, not usually upper GI bleeding, but we have seen uh, severe duodenal bleeding uh, even after uh, endotherapy, it was not controlled, but the incidences are very, very less nowadays. So mid-gut volvulus or gastric duplication duplication cyst, all gastric duplication, all these things we have to do surgery. So for the gastric polyp in the first patient, we have done the surgery, but for the second two, second uh, for two patients, we have done surgery, but for the third patient, we could do a um, gastric uh, polypectomy. Uh, actually, we did the polypectomy with the endo loop so that we have already um, published in our endoscopy bleeding series. So we have, we have sometimes we have to take the help of invasive radiology because where we are not being able to uh, control the bleeding, angiographic obliteration of the vessels in case of severe bleeding, especially if it is like pancreatic vessels coming and sprouting through the stomach and sometimes um, you know, massive blood from the duodenum or duodenal gastrointestinal artery coming through the duodenum or sometimes in the upper GI bleeding, I'm saying, and sometimes in the biliary tract also, there might be very biliary um, vessels which are uh, actually bleeding through the biliary tract or the common bile duct. There also the angiographic help usually is taken. And nowadays actually endoscopic ultrasound can take uh, uh, do the work like the angiographic obliteration also with the help of endoscopic ultrasound techniques and they can do the coiling. And this has been um, applic applied uh, quite a lot in case of gastric varicell bleeding obliteration. Other methods like if we if we find that there are lots of erosions we have found and we are suspecting CMPA awards um, cow's milk protein, antibiotics for septicemia, platelet transmission and CVF somatopsia, sorry for the mistake. Uh, FFP, cryoprecipitate factor replacement for coagulation diathesis and factor seven concentrate for severe ALA with massive bleeding, sometimes it does help factor seven and it's, it's quite costly, but uh, sometimes we have to take uh, care of it. And one unit may cost 60,000 and the uh, other two units, I mean, the second unit, second unit what is available is around 95,000. So to conclude what we can say that GRB bleed in children is common. Um, the way two incidence is not well reported. And what we have reported, and that is under peer review, our study, we have found the commonest cause of GI bleeding is ulcer and uh, erosion, erosion, erosion. So it's uh, different from the other studies in the in India where everybody showed that the gastric, the, the esophageal varices were the common cause of bleeding. But in our case, it was uh, commonest cause was the uh, ulcer erosive disorder. And uh, often associated with an unwell child, hemodynamically unstable patients should be stabilized prior to endoscopy. But that patient, this patient today, uh, patient was hemodynamically stable, but hemoglobin is only 3.5. We couldn't raise the hemoglobin at all until we solved this problem of uh, the bleeding for this patient, what we have done three days ago. And it was very difficult for me <laughs> to actually make the anesthetist uh, um, put the anesthesia for this patient. So endoscopic procedures result in more definitive pathological diagnosis, therapy, and prognostication. So please take help of endoscope, which is available in your um, uh, actual institution. So please take help, the, take help of it and inform the gastroenterologist in time. We have gastroenterologists available and please inform them within 24 hours whenever the patient gets admitted. Any hematopsis marina should be informed to the gastroenterologist whenever they're getting admitted. So IV acid suppressive therapy for upper GRB reduces morbidity and mortality in both well and unwell children. Octreotide for portal hypertension helps before endoscopy and endotherapy. And these two are revolutionary actually for this to bleeding management. And judicial use of resources and only refer to pediatric gastroenterologists, surgeons, reduce complications and mortality. So please manage all these cases carefully and be ready to refer in time. Thank you so much. Any questions for anybody? No, you have said so brilliant. I don't think Very nice, Vashati. Thank you, Mahadi. Thank you, Deklam. Very good. For the juniors, anybody has any question, please make it clear. Because, um, 
ultimately well, we uh, me and Shubhamai both actually want uh, to get people in time so that we can manage and we can actually arrange everything uh, in time also.